Okay, well, it's uh, two after seven, so let's call this meeting of the Old Springs Planning Commission to order. Uh, Judy, would you take the roll? Yes, Reed. Here. Sims. Here. Stiles. Here. Hotel. Here. Also present is Village Planner, Denise Homer, uh, Representative from Coolidge Wall, Jessica Brockman, uh, Johnny Burns, uh, Electric Superintendent just arrived, uh, Village Manager Penny Bates will be here on behalf of the Solar Array hearing. And we are expecting Adam Abraham. If he does not appear shortly, Chris Rubin will be sitting. Thanks, Judy. Uh, we have an agenda in front of us. We have two public hearings tonight um, and uh, some uh, agenda planning to do. Uh, any additions, modifications, deletions? If not, we'll press on. Uh, review of the minutes from last June. Uh, anyone have any comments on the first page? Second page. The third page. Fourth page. Fifth. Six or seven. Uh, if not, we have a motion to accept the meeting minutes as they stand. So moved. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. And one abstention. One abstention. Thanks, Judy. Great minutes as always. Thank you. Uh, the next item on the agenda is communications. We do have one communication that's with, uh, from Ted Dinell regarding the pocket neighborhood community development zoning ordinance. He sent the draft to us. Um, did he say he talked to Ted about this at all? Uh, no, it was just a very little bit. He was planning on being here tonight. Okay. Yeah, he's not. Well, he might be a little later. I told her to carry him in. Oh. Because yeah. we're in the business. Oh, he's under the business? Yeah. Okay. Very good. Next item is uh, council report. Jerry, do you have anything to? Uh, Unfortunately, I wasn't at the council meeting last night. Okay. Um, um, was there anything significant that came up? The, the only thing that I would say would be anything that would be relevant to the planning commission is that the uh, hearings from Morris Dean regarding uh, sewer tapping, which might in the future trigger an annexation or not, that's sort of under, under review. Both of those ordinances are tabled at this time, and they'll be reviewed again on the 18th. Okay, so the uh, next item on the agenda is a public hearings. The first one is a conditional use application for uh, 375 West North College Street for a garage. And um, again, the way we hold these is we hear from staff, hear from the applicant, we have a discussion, open the public hearing, uh, hear from the community, uh, and then have further discussion and uh, at that point try to reach some resolution on the uh, on the application. So Denise, do you want to start? Sure. Um, the property owner, Brooke Overs, who's here in the audience, is seeking permission to build a garage in the Littlewood subdivision, and this is a uh, designated planned unit development. It has in the original recorded site plan a 27-foot perimeter that was established by the Homeowners Association. Uh, because of that, um, a variance was needed as well as permission from the HOA. We did receive that approval for the garage setback variance. Um, although normally BZA would um, handle variances when, uh, with the new zoning code, uh, when it comes to um, PUDs, uh, the BZA doesn't have that authority. It, it falls onto the Planning Commission, which is the original body that would have granted the PUD plan. So that is why they are here tonight for the variance. Um, Ms. Overs is, um, <clears throat> purchased the property uh, a year or so ago with the understanding that she would be allowed to build a garage um, as a previous owner, had applied for and received permission back in 2011 uh, to uh, have a setback of 15.5 feet at that time. She's requesting 
and it'd be able to set back 15 feet from the property line, uh, which is a five foot variance from what our code says. Our code says 20 feet. Um, and then, of course, the setback for the HOA is 27. And then she's also requesting a half a foot on the side property line. Um, it says that uh, the driveway entrance, I think, has, uh, if it was on West North College Street, which, if you can show the picture. Nope, I'm sorry. There's a drive, the drive, the main road is West North College, and then there's a, a gravel road. It is a designated street, as I understand it, um, which is called Green Street. It's a little, actually it's a little offshoot of the main Green Street, and it, was, it is not a through street. And um, her uh, property line, if you can see her driveway is right after that big tall gray fence there. So the, there was a bit of concern with the setback of 15 feet along with parking a vehicle in front of it that that might go out into the road. But in fact, um, Ms. Overs did do a check of that. She parked it as she'd be in front of that location. And it doesn't even go past the, the gray uh, fence that you see there on the right. I think I'd have more concern if it was actually going out onto West North College, but it's not. Okay. Uh, you care to add anything? Please, not this time, before she does. Would this be a case where you, where you would make a recommendation or a Um, yeah, I said I, you, you can approve it. Um, my recommendation was you can approve it, okay. set that, or approve if you had any conditions okay. that you felt okay. were. Uh, yeah. I just want some clarification. Yeah. Okay. Anything to add? Okay. Uh, any discussion? I think the, uh, I mean, zoning guys looked at this already. I mean, these are the same dimensions as they've already looked at, so. It seems reasonable. Yeah, absolutely. But then again, you have to work the Yeah. Okay, so if there's no further discussion, we'll open the public hearing. Is there anyone here who has anything to say regarding this matter? If so, step forward and don't introduce yourself and, uh, and let it rip. Uh, uh, good evening, I'm Roy Qualls, and uh, neighbor to Brooke, and I'm the president, current president of the Homeowners Association. So uh, this request was walked around to the neighbors, uh, all, all of the, and. Uh, Little wood and it's got two thirds, more than two thirds of the signatures uh, required for any sort of uh, uh, change to the covenants or the thing like that. So it has a lot of, a lot of support from the neighborhood. Okay, thanks. Uh, anyone else? If not, we'll close the public hearing. Any further discussion? Um, Yeah, you know, Chris, do we need to come up here? My, my turn? Yeah. Lost track of the time. Thanks, Jerry. What's the problem right there? <laughs> do we need to do anything to see her? You know, I'll make a note in the in the minutes that she's joined us. This one can slide her name tag down there. We'll swap it out with eight different panels. Maybe right in front of Chris. I don't think I feel on that one. Um, so this uh, is the setback larger for this PUD than the zone zoning in the area, the 25, whatever it is. Like in the it's neighbor in the adjacent 
neighborhoods. Is this a is, are what they, is it what they're asking for less than what someone else would be allowed? Is a PUD like more? It's so it, I don't think so. It's really hard to determine that because of the way the way it's angled on the property. I mean, the front of her house is actually what we consider to be the side yard, and, and that's on the, the east side. Um, which is the side that has, um, it comes within five feet. Um, that's actually her front entrance. It's just, you know, but for the purposes of our zoning code, the front is the, is the side that faces West North College for our zoning, for the interpretation of, of lots this, of This picture, what's the orientation? Is it the one that's yeah. up? Don't you know that one? Uh -huh. No. Okay. And the garage will be there. Yeah, we'll shade it. Okay. Right there. You can have those. So, um, and I guess I'm just trying to understand the difference between the PUD zoning and the regular zoning is the the process is, is different. If someone wanted this, it would just be a, um, it would come through us. If, if this had not been a PUD, I would be meeting with BCA on this variance. Okay. It, but it would still be a variance. It would still be a variance, a setback variance. But it's just because the way the I don't know if this was in the previous zoning code, but in this zoning code, if it's a PUD, BCA doesn't have that authority. It has to go back to the Planning Commission, which the Planning Commission would have looked at the original site plan and made yeah. all those. I we've just I've never been here for a variance before, so yeah, it's not normal. Yeah, it normally would be BCA. And since it had gone through BCA before and was approved, I'm assuming that there's been a change in the zoning code since then as it relates to the PUDs. Yeah. <coughs> you wrote, we wrote that section. I don't know why we changed it, but. Um. Any further discussion? If not, do we have a motion? Sorry. A second. That is to. A motion to what? To accept. Or grant it. What's that? Does that work? The half of the variance on the side of the PUD. Five foot on the front. Right. Yeah. Right. 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 Judy, call the roll, please. Yes. Reed. Yes. Sims. Yes. Fast. Yes. Ozell. Yes. Yes. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. What's the next step? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, I would like to take the work and then get back to you so you can go to Grand County Building Rights. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Thank you all for your time. Okay, next hearing is conditional use um, and site plan review for the Glass Farm Solar Array. Uh, we had a little glitch here that came up. Um, Patty, you want to speak to this real quick? I'll be best with you. <laughs> yes, um, Matt brought it to Denise and my attention about 10 minutes ago um, that unfortunately the solar is not a permitted use in the residential um, zoning, in residential zones. Um, it's not conditional use and it's not a permitted use. Um, what I would like to do, um, if it's all right, is to go ahead and hear this because Denise seems to feel like there may be a, uh, an exception rule in there uh, somewhere um, that she has read and she just couldn't lay her fingers on it um, at the moment. So what I'd like to do is, if you would, go ahead and hear the case because we have two representatives of Dovetail Solar here tonight um, on behalf of Dovetail and AEP. And I'd like to go ahead and have you hear the case and then 
get with uh, legal and do a little bit more in-depth research and see um, under what circumstances this could be permitted. And this Thanks. is a site plan review as well. Yes, yeah, so this is a site plan review. And, and, and so I think it makes sense just for us to hear the germane facts and then as and not have a vote, essentially leave it open and, and, and until there's some kind of a, a, administrative uh, Decision. decision or something that uh, as to whether we can go forward with this or not. Um, so I have a question because most of that land is farm. Yes. But it, so it's considered residential and not farm. Right. I have because the same question. <laughs> we eliminated the agricultural zoning yeah. from our the new code, and so it became R B under the the new the new map and the new code. So even though it is farm, you know, it's still right now considered far B. So all that aside, <laughs> um, if you guys are all in agreement that we I suggest we just press on and um, next month or whatever we, um, we come back to this and uh, Deal with it again. Well, I guess I have another question in terms of the, the zoning. So is there a zoning at all in the village? I mean, obviously there has to be because Antioch has, or is that the, in terms of educational? So so utilities, solar facilities, non-residential, are conditional use in EI, so okay. that's Antioch, yeah. and they're permitted in I-1 and I-2. So I-1, I-2, that's the industrial, that's Bernay, that's the uh, uh, 800 Dane Street, um, no worse. And I, I did want to point out too that um, as we discussed a little bit, um, there are limited spaces for the solar array in the village. And I think Matt, the only one that we said would apply would be the Bernay site, um, which is not available. Yeah. I just have a process question. Uh, if Denise cannot lay her fingers on what she thinks might be somewhere, would it make sense for Planning Commission to make a recommendation that uh, that be changed in the zoning code? And what their recommendation would be, should it be changed in terms of putting the array where it's being planned? So this would either be changing the zoning of that particular lot or changing the requirement the, the use requirements. The use requirements for because RV. If we wait another month and figure out, oh, there actually is no way to do this under the current code, then it's the time frames till it gets to then it would have to go to council, wouldn't it, to be yeah, I, yeah, it's a text amendment process. It could be a win, you know, it's 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 not only planning commission planning commission can make a recommendation, but then it has to get two two parents of uh, council. I think um, changing it in terms of allowing it in other places, I'm not sure that that's going to be the answer either. Because, and maybe Johnny can speak to this as to where our cap is on solar arrays that are non non-residential uh, other than the village non-residential residential. Uh, residential i mean well i mean this yeah. but this facility is considered not when we say residential we're yeah. meaning in on the homes rooms. yeah yeah non-residential solar rays in a residential of, area any it doesn't matter where it is non-residential solar rays other than it belong, we're already so to change it is already maxed. Well, I it's unless it's the village because that's we are the power supply. I don't. Right? Yeah, I don't think that. Yeah, I don't think that that was Judith's question. I think Judith's question would be um, if you if ca if the planning commission so chose to go ahead and not only make a recommendation to permit it, but make whatever a recommendation on whatever change would be needed to permit it. 
and Did the council change the zoning code without a recommendation from planning commission? I'm guessing that council would want a recommendation. I, I, That's why I'm they probably could, so but I don't think they council would. And they say, well, we really want a recommendation because right. <laughs> you know you're eating up a couple more months. Yeah. I, I I I guess the only thing that I see is is we're going to go a long way around to get at one one little thing that we need to do. I mean. It's only this solar array would only be for the village of Yellow Springs. We're not talking about any other solar arrays. I think there was a, probably a reason why they had them only in industrial or educational. And again, I don't know what the history is on that, but it, there probably wasn't that well thought through a reason. Well, well I think it, I think there was a question about not wanting to gobble up residential land using the you know, big array, and I think that's why we. For said class farms would yeah. be RB because it had always been considered to be a future residential expansion to the village. And rather than hodgepodge a bunch of different uses as, you know, on an as come basis, I think the, the consensus was to, to kind of put it all under one, one designation and, and work with it from there. So, uh, I don't think anyone was anticipating a solar array out there at the time, though, of course. Well, maybe they were. I mean, maybe that was something that, you know, like to set that land aside for housing right. would be a, a wish. Yeah, no one was considering. Right. Yeah. So right. it seems like the most reasonable thing to do is change the zoning on that's fine, right? Should it be a PUD? Well, I would certainly hate to say that we're going to let solar, large scale solar arrays in residential be everywhere in the village. Okay. It doesn't make sense to me. If we don't want that, then, you know, then the other option is, like you said, to change the designation. Can, can we sort of who, who, is anyone in favor of changing the requirements on residential B? Well, let's let's just go through and hear all the information. Okay. And just figure out where we come from there with the okay. facts in hand. Because I don't think we all know all those details. So let's let's start with Denise and, 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 and hear from the applicant. Okay. And, okay. And yeah, let's start. Now, obviously, this has been a long-term goal of council to help reduce our carbon footprint and council has been looking at a possible solar uh, array facility for some time now. Um, they identified the glass farm as the best location for it and uh, have contracted with AEP on-site partners um, to manage the solar facility. Uh, tonight with us we have Dovetail Solar and Wind which is the uh, contracted uh, company that AEP is using to actually construct it. Um, the glass farm itself is, is a 43, just under 43 acre site that the village owns. Um, there, I mentioned three locations of undeveloped ingress and egress points to the farm, but um, there's actually four. Um, the frontage along King Street, there's the um, location off, uh, off of Ridgecrest, there is a right-of-way access off of Yellow Springs Fairfield Road, and then there is also a right-of-way undeveloped, not not a, it's just right now, uh, undeveloped land off of Wright Street that can also, uh, you could also enter or exit the uh, glass farm to the north. Yes. Um, the a couple points I wanted to bring forth and then I thought maybe we could just go through the site plan review requirements and have the panel answer any of those questions. Um, they uh, mentioned uh, there is a, one thing in the uh, site plan review about structures within a 300 foot perimeter. Um, they so there might be some questions relating to the west side of this property. It's 35 feet from the west side boundary and that 
that property on the other side is the township, so we might want to ask some questions about shading along there. We don't really have any control of the township as far as setbacks go. And also, um, the, the fences that are in the, in the residential districts, in non-residential districts, you can have a fence up to eight feet in height, but in residential districts, which this is currently zoned as, it, it can only be six feet. Um, so there's going to be a one, we're going to have to have a one foot uh, conversation about one additional foot on that. Um, we also might want to talk, council had also mentioned, uh, besides the chain link fencing that was going to be used, uh, there was talk about uh, a black or green weaving, <clears throat> and we might want to ask some questions about that as well. And then I think we could have just a detail come up, and then we can go through one by one the uh, actual site plan review standards under section 126806. Yeah, okay. Um, yeah, do you folks want to add to this? Well, Um, tell you what, my strong suit is answering questions. When we get to that one, I'll be able to work. Um, I guess, uh, what are you looking for from me right now? I came to just describe, just in general, what the design is at this point, and just the sure. general characteristics. Okay. Be great. Let's um, that, so. okay, great. So, uh, this is approximately a one megawatt solar array. Uh, comparable in size to the array that's at Antioch College right now. Um, uses a slightly different technology, the racking, the, the support structure instead of being fixed, it actually actively tracks the sun on just a single axis, so uh, it allows us to harvest more energy in a given amount of space because we're, we're using some mechanical components to actually track the motion of the sun. Uh, we're located, as you guys know, um, on the very edge of village property, and what is Planning to be an RV zone, um, and we're adjacent to the township right there. Uh, we inside the fence line, we're about five and one half acres currently, as as the system is planned. Um, obviously, subject to everybody's approval. And uh, the main access point, as planned right now, is off of Ridgecrest Drive, uh, especially for construction. One of the reasons for that was because. Ridgecrest allows deliveries to be given to the property without impeding traffic on either Yellow Springs Fairfield Road or on King Street. So by having that small spur at the end of Ridgecrest Drive that's next to the farm property, um, on the eastern side of that drive, there's currently there's no um, driveway access or property to obstruct by having a truck parked there while we actually do construction and unloading. We can leave the property to the east your house right there uh, should be open at all times during construction there will be no blockages of traffic so it's it's a good site for us logistically so we don't have to obstruct traffic while we're doing our operations also it gives us access to the site without having to clear any additional trees um, the right of way that is to the north of the property to yellow springs fairfield is technically the shortest route but it's heavily wooded right now and would require a lot more infrastructure to be installed to make it so here, it's already a farm road, essentially, for the person that's actively harvesting on here right now. I think it's a soy field. But, uh, so we already have a relatively established path that would require pretty minimal work to, to have it support construction traffic. Um, structural height, I know, is uh, something that was of concern. The tallest the array would really be, because we're in preliminary design, I just want to be um, approximately we're at about 5 feet 10 inches when the array is fully tracked in the early morning or late evening. So from a visual obstruction, we're really not that visible in the frame of an agricultural area, especially when that switches over to corn next year or the year after. Usually that's the standard crop rotation. Um, when everything's level, we're really just at about 3, 3.5 feet when you start really paying attention to the fine details, thicknesses of materials and stuff like that. So, 
right now is proposed a six foot fence with three strands of barbed wire on top that's meant for preventing people from getting access to the site because there are higher voltages there, higher than residential voltages. And uh, it could also be the code, the National Electric Code also allows a seven foot pure chain link fence if barbed wire is, if you guys are opposed to that for whatever reason. Um, just in our opinion, that, that kind of achieves its goal the most effectively as a deterrent from keeping people from getting in when they shouldn't be. Uh, we plan on tying our fence line in with the property line, so we don't plan on, we plan on sharing the western property boundary. Our fence line would be shared with the actual end of the village's property, just so that we don't have an existing fence line and then, you know, 10 or 20 foot strip of land and then a new fence just for the solar array. It kind of makes things awkward. Um, it would be a harder to maintain area that way. We're just bringing everything in that fence. The operator, AEP on-site partners, would then be responsible for maintaining that whole section so there's not anything that the village would have to worry about at that point. Uh, Electrical interconnection, we would just need to work with the Village of Yellow Springs. You guys are your own utility. You operate your own utility. And uh, we've got provisions in place with the design to provide you guys with uh, one main conduit and one spare conduit to the corner of the property so that the utility, the utility arm of the village can pick up from there and use their preferred method of connecting to the substation. That's uh, just a few pieces of property over on the northeastern corner of the property. guys would like to know. Try to make sure I answer all the concerns here. In terms of, you say you want to enter off of uh, Ridgecrest. Ridgecrest. Now, would you then turn, if I'm looking at... On the next picture, there's a proposed temporary access and that's the already established access for agricultural purposes. So there's already a cut in the tree line so that the, the tractor can get through from field to field okay. on the northern edge. And it's wide enough for it's wide enough. It's wide enough for ongoing access, emergency access as well. So how many truckloads of stuff are gonna be? Uh, I would have to guess something on the order of 20, maybe for the whole year. Yeah, uh, you know, there's 3,000 solar modules and you can have 27 to a pallet, 12 pallets of truck. I can probably do the math a little bit faster later, but um, <laughs> probably seven truckloads of solar modules, at least seven of racking material. So you know, you're getting up to 20 pretty quickly, not to count how much um, truckloads of fencing material. It's about 3,000 feet of fence. Concrete and that kind of thing as well for the foundations? No, no concrete. They're not? No concrete. concrete. This would be a driven pier style foundation. Okay. So that's one of the benefits of this. Um, I know that stormwater and uh, soil erosion is a concern. This method, the only actual moving of earth is when we trench to put conduit in the ground underneath the main part of the array. So the square footage of disturbed soil from trenching is only going to be in the neighborhood of 5,000 square feet. Okay. about the footprint of the standard residential construction, bigger residential construction. And what are you going to put use for ground cover? Uh, just standard low-growing grass mix, typical of what the what ODOT uses in highway medians. So something that's relatively low maintenance, left on its own, shouldn't get much taller than two or three feet, uh, but requires a semi-annual mowing just to maintain it and make sure that weeds don't get too established. Is that our job? Mm -hmm. uh, generally, it, it's it's something that can be the villages or can be AEP's responsibility. It's something that's negotiated between the parties. So I, I don't know what AEP has already talked to the village about in terms of that, but that's a, 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 it's an option. AEP item. would maintain. Okay. Now, in, in terms of sound, we talked about sound why it's generating electricity. What about as these? Does it sound like the panels are going to do some rotating? Um, 
because it has to go from 60 degrees one way to 60 degrees the other way, and over the course of eight hours, it moves so slowly, the motors are really low power for, for the task that they have to pull. Um, the sound is, the, the inverters are louder than the motors that, that track the system, so they're, but they're less of a concern. And what about the material, um, the privacy weave? Is that a something that you all can do? It can be done. Um, Honestly, it just depends on what the requirements of the village are, and it's a cost item, so, so it would whatever impact that has on the arrangement. It, would it wouldn't the interfere with the, you know, okay. It would not interfere with the operation of the system. Um, even wireframe shading from a chain link fence is unacceptable, so we, su we space everything far enough away from the fence that we're not worried about the fence in any way from a shading standpoint. Even blocking breezes, we're not that. It's, it's not a serious enough impact that would even show up on a simulation. So. Can I ask that here, Johnny? What, what was the rationale behind possibly having weaving within the fence? It was something that I had spoken to Jerry DeBoer about um, at AEP because I knew of the concerns um, with the Antioch uh, array fence. and. Um, I, I knew that it had been, uh, was supposed to be black or green in color, uh, according to um, some of the, yeah. the references that I've heard. Um, and I also thought that because we were in the future thinking of making the rest of Glass Farm a residential development, that um, the privacy weave might be a good thing to have in there from the beginning. Um, so I did speak to Jerry DeBoer about it. He hasn't gotten back to me definitively on that yet, but it is something you're willing to consider. Okay. The only reason I asked that question was when I went out and looked at uh, Cedar Hill. Mm -hmm. uh, theirs was even black. I think theirs was black. And there were houses right on the side. And, you know, the fence was black, or did they have weaving? No, weaving? no, no weaving. Uh, no weaving in it was. Yeah, right up like the, the property line is in it and it mm -hmm. actually look real quick. You know, so right, and it, it and it is it's something that I just mentioned to him in passing and he said they would be willing to consider it if it was something that the planning commission felt was important enough. So Okay, thanks. Yeah. As to the location um, the whole array. Yeah. Was there any reason that it's <coughs> where it is, or just all parked it? Well, I'm, I'm looking at the 110 feet at one end and 50 feet at the other end. Yeah. Um, well, so there was a, originally um, I had this array laid out, crunched into the far northeastern segment, so the array wasn't quite as wide in the east-west direction, and it was. Um, fitted into the slot of the property as it moved north uh, to just take up as little gross area as possible. But um, the request was given back to me by AP that the village had requested that we move it south, that that area of land to the north of the array was actually going to be requested for um, some other purpose. It, seems. it would actually, when the residential development potentially takes place, that would be one of the entrances. So we wanted to leave enough room to come in that way and around the edge of the array with the two-lane road. I, I would like to suggest to possibly allow more mm -hmm. space because you've got the playroom now. You've got the budge factor that you could play with moving it a little bit further to the south mm -hmm. to allow whatever is going to happen, you know, to allow maybe perhaps a nicer design of the roadway coming into that area. Right. Um, the only thing about moving it south, and I know there's a tree line there, right, John? I'm just not sure if it's a tree line on our property or on the adjacent owner's property. Dude, so we have to be down. careful. We allow what, uh, 60 foot? Um, Corey's tree is 25 foot wide, if that, if that gives you a comparison. So we're about triple what Corey's tree is. As far as the distance? The width of 
for the front. The current number of 50 feet. So we're double so quarry street. We're double, double quarry street. street. So eight, eight. that's a pretty good size entrance. And there's not a plot in Yellow Springs that's okay. that wide. Does that allow for sidewalks or is that just street? That's the right, right way. That's the right, that's right way. Okay. I'm just thinking, you know, to maintain the, the ambiance of country uh -huh. that it would be nice to keep the northern fence area more uh, out the weeds and, and, and uh, more a country look, and then moving it south a little bit allows more leeway. Well, I'm, I'm sure that they would move it far. They have to keep it 60 feet from the tree line because they can't have the shading. Right. And so I, I, I'm sure that if they can move it any to make it, you know, to that minimum, they just have to keep that minimum. So. Um, I know I don't know what the future holds there. We were just on the site um, today right. before the right. meeting. A lot of the trees on that southern tree line are dead. Right. Or there are zero leaves on those trees in the middle of the beginning of July. It probably doesn't go well with those trees. Um, those are the tallest trees, too. I don't know if they're elms or ash. Or elms or or ash. ash. I would assume ash because of that. But because uh, there are 13 big trees, and every single one of them is dead. If they have a pitchfork, they're elms. Uh, I was probably still 600 feet from the side. You look at the, yeah. Okay. Yeah, we'll, we'll just have to determine board. ownership. Yeah, okay. exactly. So if the array needs to be moved south, then everyone's in agreement. There's no issue with the exact location of the array. And then I have another question about the, um, the transformer line that goes to our power plant. Is there any issue that we're going across uh, Johnny can answer township that. property? Johnny um, needs we to want come. To Johnny. Cross any, we won't. The way it's designed now, we won't cross any township lines. It will be taking the line straight up to Fairfield and then back to the source. Okay, okay. The drawing shows it going on the property line here. See? So you're going to go out to Fairfield and then down. Yes. Okay. That's just an assumption on my part here. I'm okay. wrong. Yep. That's cool. That's cool. No, I'm all in favor of, of the solar array, you know, using the Ridgecrest access to get to the property to do the development. I have no problem. I just think that now is the time to look at the future design and if we move it south a smidgen to allow for future development of perhaps a little bit more attractive design. Yeah. Well, <laughs> let's take advantage of it. It does make sense to have the if you're you know if this 110 foot area is going to be nature, right? Which it probably is, or farm to to move it back, you know, 50 feet and have that extra 50 feet in the front. It makes it makes sense to me. That's a good suggestion. Okay. But you can build space. Exactly. So Instead of breaking right. exactly. Yeah. yeah. That's the only suggestion I have. Uh, suggestion. That's it. And then there was a thing about um, the, on one of the letters, uh, the hydrants on uh, uh, Dovetail's letter. There is a fire hydrant at the corner of Ridgecrest and Robinwood. Yes. So that's not listed in here. Oh, it's not? In no. The narrative? Okay. So if you want, want to add I was relying the on the GIS map from the area, and I didn't see it here, so. Will there be any other structures besides the solar array itself with the panels? Uh, no, the only other structure would just be us mounting an electrical disconnect next to the pad mounted transformer, so the utility style transformer on the ground next to the array. There wouldn't be any okay, no so plans for any storage sheds or so anything the like that. Transformer would not be it would be, it would be. Um, yeah, no reason I asked the question is I looked at the, the one I would see the go uh, a little bit over there. Yeah, I, I might have a different meaning of enclosed. Um, okay. It might have just because of what I do here. Um, at Antioch, for example, are you familiar with the array down yeah. at Antioch? They have a transformer um, just mounted next to the array, just on a concrete pad. Okay. That is what we're talking That's about, something very comparable to okay. that. Yeah. So the maximum height is three feet or four feet, something like that. Yeah, on a megawatt transformer like that, maybe four, maybe five. But it, it would be right in line with the rest of the square. Oh, yeah. That's kind of what I was talking about. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 
It would just be the green enclosure essentially, the green box. Okay. One more comment. <laughs> On the lighting, uh, motion activated security lighting might be added. And I'm thinking there's so much wildlife back there that you might not want to do it because it'll go off all the time with this. I just really put it in there as, as a potential in case um, if there ends up being ongoing issues for any reason, vandalism or something like that, it would just be an option if we've never installed one on an array so far. It's just. They always talk about allowing for an extra circuit out there while we're there in that case they need to pull out a security yes. layer. So but it's not an active plan. <coughs> but being there, there may be a residential area. Um, Maybe might be necessary. Maybe. We've also not really had any issues with people. Usually well, having a six foot fence with a bar wire and the high voltage people generally <laughs> stay away from that. But there, there are exceptions always. You get people going into substations for whatever reason, sometimes. Any more questions? Okay, thanks. Do you have anything to add, Johnny? I'll take you first. Well, we're over public hearing in a minute. So. The, the only so thing that I, I add about the uh, right away is is the right away is, is pretty equal to what comes in off of Fairfield. So off of uh, Fairfield right there in the little entrance, it's really no wider than what we have going into the rest of the open field that you'd like to see wider. The other thing is is we've kind of laid it out this way and we've allowed the farmer to plant everything so if this could squash down then we're going to pay for crops. Because he's already planted that. Right. So that's another thing to think about. Did he plant it at, at uh, South End? He planted it as close as he could get. <laughs> uh, well, yeah. we, we staked it out prior yeah, to, yeah. And, and he's planted it all the way up to the line. And if he's watching this, he's not going to be upset if it doesn't go through. He is going to be upset because he's lost money. Yeah. Johnny, in terms of uh, traffic on Ridgecrest, are they allowed to park on both sides of the street there? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, so there is space to get a truck through there and see the parking uh, Originally, I, I, you can blame me. I'm the one that brought them in on Ridgecrest because, and to put that road in, a temporary road through off of Fairfield is almost $100,000. Yeah. Pardon me, I'm not talking about it. And I'm just making sure that. To make to make deliveries, and yeah. they can they can park on one side and they still get out on the other side because there's not a drive driveway access uh, opposite of your house, and they can also back into the blast farm to be able to offer the stuff. Okay. So coordination will be a key, and and that's we will make sure that it's all coordinated correctly. That way you don't have ten semis sitting there waiting to be unloaded all through that plot. Yeah, because if I'm correct, they uh, get into their kind of stores. Sure. Right. So we could we could actually hold them out, you know, somewhere else, and then have them one one truck's down, the other truck has them. Okay. Okay. Uh, we need to have any further discussion before we open a public hearing. You know, I just want to say that I agree with Chris about moving it south, even if it means that the village would have to pay for some crops, that it just seems in the long term it's better to have it properly placed than to let a little thing like, I mean, it, and it does seem like a small thing of some crops, because that is a temporary, you know, usage. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Uh, anything else? If not, open the public hearing. If you have something to say regarding this matter, come up and identify yourself. <laughs> and Hello, my name is Ted Donnell. Um, a dilemma for your use is you, the village, since it owns the property and it has underlying RV zoning, you can dedicate that entire area to an easement, a utility easement. There's nothing that says that a utility easement can't be 
which it is, which it is. So it is a utility evening. You don't have to do anything except establish that legally as the And what would that mean to have a utility? I mean, how do you go about doing that? Well, that would just make it, it would just negate the need for changing the zoning sure. or the. Uh, but what's, or the, the process what's the process, though? To approve a utility? Essentially, the village would have to grant itself an easement. Uh -huh. We have utility easements everywhere throughout the village, and, and you think good, and thank you very much, Ted. Um, but um, what we would have to do is we would have to basically survey out that area, um, make it a, a utility easement, write an easement, grading it to ourselves, and file it. It's a fairly simple process. I mean, we, have, we actually have a couple of other easements in process right now. Um, one is for a temporary construction access road for the water plant down on the Cody Road, <coughs> where we're getting a temporary construction easement from one of the residents to widen the road to get the trucks in. So this would just be a permanent easement, um, like the one we have between the houses on Limestone and between Limestone and Davis and that type of thing. Okay. Uh, anyone else have any comments on the uh, while we have the public hearing? The microphone open. Uh, if not, we'll close the public hearing. conditioned upon that happening. Yes. That's what I'm thinking. We could add under your recommendation the conditional uh, uh, granting of the easement for utility space on the west end of the property as part of this list of conditional uses into your recommendation. Would that work? Yeah, add a condition that the easement is granted before So do we have to wait for that easement to be done no. now? No, I think we can pass this tonight yeah. if with that as a condition and yeah. um, and then it's an administrative deal on their end to make sure we that's we also all. recommend uh, officially recommend that the village grant itself an easement or is that what we're doing it? I, I think we just say that uh, that there's an approved utility okay. easement filed as Okay. As a condition. Okay. Yeah. 
I, I feel a lot more comfortable with that because rather than going in and changing the zoning. Yes. Uh, <laughs> this, yes. Yes. Plus, yeah. plus the fact that our non-residential, we're kind of at a cap on that anyway, so we're changing something for no, that will never be maybe used. You know, so um, yeah, I feel a lot better about that. Yes. Do we also have to put the condition for the the we yeah, we can, if you we want can, it to be a condition. That's like all that stuff we can we can include. Yeah, I mean, if that's what we're going to do. And move it in somewhat. Right. So. Can I respond to that one? I don't I don't understand the reason to make that fence okay. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, if if I'm looking across that field, I would much prefer to look through that array to the other field beyond that array than to look at some big ass fence out in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> I, I, I prefer the coloring of the fence to black or green to the weaving. I think weaving right. always deteriorates. deteriorates. Well, in fact, your point, Jerry, is that you almost couldn't see it. Right. Yeah. right. Well, that changes. I'll say something about that, though. The um, deer don't, deer need to see something when they're running across the field. They'll run right into a black fence. You know, and there is, you know, you have fauna. It's a path for fauna. You're going to block that path. You know, so you you don't want to make it invisible to them, but they, and they'll learn after a couple times. <laughs> you know, it, it really is a hazard. So the, you know, again, I think it's something that, you know, like a galvanized chain link fence that just listens in the sun like the solar ray. You know, it's, it's contextual in its location. I don't see the point of it. Or if you make it residential when you build, you want to look at it. Well, now the residents, if they, you know, if they come to the village and say, you know, I'm going to develop this end of the glass barn, and as a condition to that, we don't want to look at the fence, then the village has an option to put something up at that time. But until such time, my goodness, you don't know what's going on. Well, I mean, yeah. fencing is really. You have to have a fence for security. I mean, you'll take, right. making the fence okay. Is what I have to talk about. Are they at night they can hear the between the yellow and eyes and the black? Oh, they, they'll see anything that glistens in the moon or they won't see black. The reason I say because I, you know, when I was over at Cedarville, which there is this out in the farm area, they, the folks I talked to, didn't they? The black would go away. I mean, you would not see it near as much as the yellow. You would see it during the day more, but less at night. Yeah. You would see the black during the day more and less at night. And but vice versa with the sun. Yeah, the only thing I don't, frankly, I don't think it makes that much difference. I just don't like making I, that I, I, I feel like I would consider the deer smarter than that <laughs> over time. Well, over time, it's like anything. Yeah. But, you know, how injured would they be? I, I would prefer it yeah. to be black or green than to mm -hmm. silver. Do you all have any recommendation about that? I mean, you have experience. Do you have a problem with deer running into the fence? No, um, but to be honest, we haven't done the privacy stripping on anything more than an enclosure around a larger inverter or the transformer. Have you done colored fences as opposed to the galvanized? Have you done block of green as opposed to? Uh, yeah, on smaller, on smaller projects, yeah. We're about to do a much larger one, but um, we haven't heard of deer being an issue in general. Uh, I'm trying to think of the, the closest example. We could talk to the city of Xenia, for example. You know, they're in a very similar environment that's off their wastewater treatment plants, which is right next to what is a, currently a corn or soybean field, depending on the year. I haven't heard any. I mean, it's a maintenance yeah. thing. You can look up if you've got you know, big dents in your fence. <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, but no, we haven't heard of it and as a deer being an, an issue, but we only have experience generally with the, the standard chain link fence. So most of the time it's not altered from that state on the scale of the project. So okay. this recommendation, I would suggest we add two conditions more, moving the array 80 feet south from the uh, Dillon Farm. Uh, so you're basically to remove, to remove all of the property lines? 
Pardon me? Well, oh, it has yeah. to be 60 feet away from the tree line. Yeah, right? and yeah. 60 yeah. feet. So it, all together, there's 100 and what, 160 feet total? Well, but we are not exactly sure where the tree line is relating yeah. to the property line. Those property line, the, the right. GIS aerial is not exact. We can't make a measure it, from that. I've walked it. And there's on this property line, it's primarily just the uh, horse fence, just the country fence. So there's no trees there. Very little on the western side of the but property. But this tree line here is and what we're tree. talking about. The southern they, tree line is relatively significant. Yeah. And there are tallest trees dying, but there are many trees that are alive. There. What I'm saying is instead of saying 80 feet, which might be wrong, we could say 60 from the tree line. That's a good way to put it. Right. Okay. So, okay. so it's as close as possible. So maybe 80 feet that way would be, would be 80 feet from the tree line. Who knows? Could I? I'm could I ask that we give a little bit in that, I mean, 60, 60 feet is generally accepted, but if we could have a little bit of given that based yeah. on, I mean, they have to determine where that shadow is going to fall. Yeah. All right. So. And, and we can make a general say that staff will push it as far south as possible. Okay. Yeah. Great. Sure. We can try and characterize the height of the tree line and, and what's there because depending on how old those trees are, they could get yeah. much larger yeah. Yeah. Um, and plan for the future. Okay. And the other condition being the utility easement. Otherwise, and the, right. the uh, you know, Denise made a point about the height of the fence, and if you raise the foot and you can eliminate the barbed wire, I mean, I, I think that's a lot nicer option than having three strands of barbed wire. Um, it just well, I thought the barbed wire was for security, but by yeah. raising the fence, you can eliminate the barbed wire? Correct. From, okay. a, from a, an electrical code standpoint, they are equal. Yeah. Six feet with barbed wire or seven feet of just pure chain link from that standpoint meets the code requirement. Yeah. That, that sounds good. Okay. So, uh, really, I just want someone to say something in general. I like the idea, but I hate this location. I really don't like us doing this to last farm. We're chopping it up. We're taking, I mean, we need a master plan for the last farm. We need something because we gobbled up a big chunk of it with the pond. We, now we're going to take another big chunk out. And I I find it frustrating we can't put this on the Bernay property because there's okay. nothing that's going to go on the Bernay property ever in our lifetime except yeah. for something like this. We tried to talk to them twice and they are not interested in selling it. It probably has something to do with the continuing EPA uh, oversight of it. It's horrible. I mean, it's, it's, it's a waste. It's in both regards, I mean, it seems to me. So maybe we can come up with a master plan for the rest of the glass farm before it's all gone. I, I believe that's the plan of council, yes. Yeah, okay. Okay. Uh, I think I've been on just <laughs> the, uh, um, well, And you know, I agree. <laughs> Okay, so we have, it sounds like we have four conditions. We approve filing of utility easement, uh, moving it as south as far as possible, and staff can work with Dovetail to come up with that. Uh, we have a fence with no barbed wire, and whatever the part height is. Seven feet. Seven feet. And then we want to address the color of the fence or not? Just let it go. Well, they, say, they, they already said black and green. Um, they can do black or green, they say. Right. Can't be regular. Okay, so. <laughs> or regular. Then the condition <laughs> that it can either be black or green. Do we want to yes. that as a condition? Yes. I would like that as a condition. Okay. We didn't do it last time, so. Well, we did last time. They just didn't do it. I thought it was just in the picture, no. and so you didn't make the condition. No, it was actually a no, condition. I, I found it in the word. Now, so there's four conditions. Are there any others? Do it. That wasn't us. We didn't do it. I know. <laughs> this one. <laughs> are you saying that a weave or simply a color of the fence? No, we specify anything? 
But you want black or green? But you want that green? Yeah. Yeah. Don't mean to be picky about this. I just want to make sure I understand so that we do it the way you want it. Um, do you want the, the fencing, the chain link, the, the, the mesh to be that color and all the posts? Correct. Okay. Or just the mesh would be no. the, those are the two ways it goes. Black or green? Their choice. Uh, Judy, you want to see if we have those? So when you make your motion, I'm proposing this to, to you. You're, you're agreeing to um, conditionally approve the request for the site plan. With the following conditions you want included all of Denise's recommendations, and in addition to those, that uh, a utility easement be filed and recorded. Um, that the array be moved as far south as possible in coordination with village staff. Um, that the fence height be at seven feet so that no barbed wire is required. And that black or green fencing mesh, mesh and posts be utilized. Are we agreeing with that? Yes. Okay, any further discussion? If not, do we have a motion? I move to approve the recommendation as previously stated. I second. All right. Okay, Reed. Yes. Sims. Yes. Styles. Yes. Sozo. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry about the uh, <laughs> next step. Uh, <Blip. laughs> well, we found a solution. <laughs> Okay, so the next item on our agenda is a discussion regarding the pocket neighborhood community development ordinance that Ted provided us. Um, Denise, you said you haven't had a whole lot of conversations with Ted about this. So I guess, Ted, can you come up and just kind of give us the thumbnail, my name? I can, I'd be glad to. Okay, when we were re revising our Zoning code. The intent was to be able to give future developers tools to develop a denser way to develop in the village. Because we know that we're creating a green belt around the village, that our limits are limited, uh, that density is in fact something that is admirable um, for everybody in the village. Thus, we change setbacks, we change plats, we change districts. We did all of those things that were, in essence, a way to increase density. Um, something that has come up that I'm really getting a lot of um, in my own personal practice is the use of pocket neighborhoods or co-housing developments. And what those are are opportunities to take narrow street frontages that have long depth to them and put all of the vehicular access on the street frontage or right up front and then have a commons area that connects all the front doors to a common space. Um, so everything is very pedestrian oriented. Um, it's all about community. It's all about bringing back the concept that you know neighborhoods are shared. Um, Co-housing, for example, might have for every 10 to 15 cottages or co-houses on a lot, there's actually a co-house, and the co-house serves as a larger house for the community to share, for a bigger kitchen, for entertainment space, for bedrooms, additional bedrooms, things like that, and the attempt is to downsize the, the structures in order to accommodate, again, density and getting more people involved. We're, I'm in the process, um, of actually looking at several properties in the village um, to do this kind of a concept. And I just read the paper that um, Antioch is moving forward with their village commons, which this would apply to. Same, exact same thing. Um, so, you know, when I came across this, this is just, again, it's a tool. Um, and I wanted to 
throw it on the table because it's going to take you know a lot of edits. It's going to take a lot of discussion, and it could be a year before it were actually being um, and put into a code. Uh, the other part of this is that you know so the easy way of saying it, well, what about a PUD? You know, well, PUDs are not desired in any of PUDs are exceptions, and PUDs are something that makes the zoning administrator job very difficult because you have spot zoning all over the village. And the one reason that we redid the zoning code was to hopefully eliminate a lot of PUDs. Um, and this, I think, would really fit in well with um, a lot of little areas in the, in the community. Um, I'd love to go into, you know, maybe pick up a, a project and, you know, bring it to you. If I had to go through a PUD, it would be very, very difficult to maneuver through that. You know, but I would be using pretty much exactly this language uh, to describe that community and how it would be developed. So, you know, it takes some reading to get through it. Um, there are, if you Google um, co-housing or if you Google pocket neighborhoods, uh, you'll find examples all over the place. Um, I just went to one in Indianapolis. Uh, they're really cool. You know, it's all about, you know, what it in essence is, is that all the front porches face a common like the backyard. You take houses along two streets and you put the front porches on the interior of the backyard and everybody shares that big backyard face. <coughs> That's what this is all about. Not like you're, you're not parking in front of your house, you're parking separate, separate off the street and walking. And yes. Yeah. It's all about walking. And, and, you know, everybody, you, know, you have community gardens, you have, you know, a lot of it. seniors really enjoy these communities. Young families really enjoy them because of kids. Um, I'm actually working on one in Vandalia that is for veterans, for veterans. Um, veterans that are on the fringe that don't get into, don't want to be in the system that need some help. So we're doing a 48 unit co-housing community. Uh, and it is all either cart, uh, bike, bicycle, pedestrian, or golf carts. Accessible. No cars. No noise. So it's really pretty cool. Um, I can answer questions, uh, but I just wanted to, you know, like I said, I just wanted to throw it on the tape and, you know, kind of get an idea of where, you know, the planning commission was and, you know, what their thoughts were. Um, I think, you know, frankly, it's a pretty easy insert. And like I said before, it's a tool for developers. It gives them more options that I think are really more suited with the Yellow Spring Bike to go into development as opposed to. So would this be a new zone? Yeah, it could be. Yeah, or it could be a new chapter that allows you to develop X sizes of property with this instead of a PUD. Mm -hmm. So it could fit into any R district. And it could be an overlay in any art. I mean, I, 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 it's a great idea. I was really intrigued. I'm sorry we didn't have this when we wrote the, we wrote the code. Right. I know. Because I, I, I was under the impression when we rewrote the code that um, PUDs were actually intended to serve this purpose. And no, that wasn't the. Well, that's where a project like this would get. That's the process you would use. Um, yeah. uh, but the way that our PUD is written, it's also, you know, the um, CBE is a PUD, um, you know, which is obviously not this. Um, I mean, it kind of does catch all for things that don't quite fit elsewhere. I, yeah, that, I mean, I guess, like, I, I remember having PUDs explained to me by Laura Curtis, and this is what it sounded like, you know, at the time. But I think. In practice, it's not working that way. Well, what so, this allows you to do yeah. is not worry about the setbacks and the property lines. All that stuff is, is redefined here yeah. because of the shared common space. It's and not, it's consistent. Yeah. And it's something that can be administered. <coughs> yeah. You know, PEDs are very difficult to administer yeah. because every single PED is a spot zone. Yeah. yeah. And they're all and it, it just becomes. Oh, okay. Just, there isn't a, a sort of boilerplate PED. And that's why you do something like this and the CBE under PUD. Yeah. 
give us more. And, and right now, the way the PUD is kind of guided is you go back and you look at what most fits and you follow whatever those It's like rewriting the zoning are. code every single time someone yeah, wants right. to do something. Right. Yeah. Which means you do a project like this. Yeah. But to a degree. This, it would be this easier. actually would fit into a one acre lot. Yeah. See, I don't understand why this isn't just allowed in our residential zones. Well, like, see, we have the residential A, the residential B, the residential C, and and, and there's um, very I just don't know why they're restricted. You know, you can't. <laughs> well, there's no setbacks. Yeah, just no, but just but, the property line. Yeah. Minimum frontage. Minimum. Yeah. But we decide that. I mean, yep. if this was RC, we could put 14 units on, um, nearly 14 units on, on around an acre or so. Yeah. But that's, if it's RB, then yeah, that number goes down. And it just, there isn't that, a, you can't. Yeah, but we write the zoning code is what I'm saying. So right. That just and that's why Ted's saying. Yeah. yeah. And so, put this in there. And so yeah. what Ted's saying is if you go in and then you, so you, you go that PV route, then that's fine. But then. I have to pay attention to yeah. the whole place. I, I okay for this place, but not there. Yeah. But it's I, I just, confusing. I'm frustrated that sort of something like this wasn't, that didn't happen earlier. But <coughs> thank it, you for bringing it. Because this is starting to catch on within yeah. the last 10 years. Yeah. Really. And, you know, in areas mostly. But the intention the was there last time. I, I think oh, the yeah. intention yeah. was there because one of the things that was removed from the code or as I can tell, is there's no minimum uh, size, that there used to be a minimum size, and you had to have a living room and a yeah. bed and that is, that's gone. Yeah. To encourage, you know, smaller homes <coughs> within that whole movement. I think there was some effort made, but this, this brings it to another level. Yeah. Yeah. So where would we go with something like this? We would have to come back here and review this and then make a recommendation to council that they make a modification to the code. Mm -hmm. Now, will you write a staff report about how best to move forward on something like this? Yeah, I can do that. Tattoo, and we'll, you know, I can review it, kind of compare it against what we have. Right, because um, you get to look at cross-reference and all this crazy right. stuff. And so at that time, then, we would be making comments on it. Right. Yeah. Or if you have comments now. make a yeah. recommendation to Denise that she try to come up with the right language for us. You know, the <coughs> I think this is a wonderful idea, and I think definitely we should be doing it. You know, I had a couple thoughts just going through it that <coughs> it, there needs to be some things that sort of are change to make it more affordable. Um, because there are, depending on the size of the development, there are certain things that are required in it that are probably going to, would make it prohibitive. But if you're trying to, because the idea I'm assuming is to try to have more affordable, more housing, some of them smaller. And so um, I think that's something that should be thought about. Um, it, you know, and I won't get into all my comments, because I, I had quite a few. <laughs> yeah, so I, I and, and not to require something in this that isn't in the zoning, such as garages aren't required. And so, yeah. but in here it has it. Storage units aren't required. And not to have things in it that probably can't be enforced, such as putting bikes on porches. That'd be really hard to enforce. I can't see Denise going around and, you know, write down every time somebody has a bike on. So there's just some things, you know, there's small things. Oh, this, this is. This is literally out of the box, yeah. and it doesn't apply to yellow frames without this. Yeah. I mean, and you're right on. The one thing I will say about affordability, though, in a pocket community is that you don't have a road that connects all the big units. You know, you've got, and that in and of itself drive down the cost of that land of development significantly, which goes to the affordability factor. And this is really, you know, a byproduct of affordable and sustainable living practices and things like that. Um, you know, even the new urbanists are coming mm -hmm. up and getting into this thing. It's, it's pretty neat. Um, but it's catching on big, and I think it would be fun to have, you know, Yellow Springs as a place that's progressive. And, you know, we've already done it with our zoning 
what you want to be. And, you know, we define what we want to be as a community, and I think that the new zoning code reinforces what we want to be more than the old zoning code. And I think we just have to keep adding to the tools and make it that much better. So yeah, because we know it's not perfect, the new code. Yeah. Oh, no, no. So no, maybe no. instead of so uh, a of report from Denise, we should have on the agenda to discuss to discuss it first yes. and then we can make recommendations yeah. to you and then you can make the back for us. Yeah so you can you can you give us something like a broad outline of maybe some other examples mm -hmm. and then also kind of a roadmap of how we would go about getting something like this to council yeah. with a recommendation and kind of lay that out into like what? how to apply the best ways to apply this that would be conducive to regulation and to you know to actually doing it. And <laughs> and we have. Have. It's yeah. an overlay process. Yeah. yeah. So what it says is that you can overlay this development option within a certain district. Yeah. And get by, you know, if you have a certain size, but you can get by without having to do individual lives, et cetera, et cetera. And, and, and I don't want to see this take a year. <laughs> no, I mean... We'll discuss it at our next meeting. Yeah, no, that's I, what I, I think I'm we should discuss it at our next meeting. Yeah, and, and, you know, if, if we agree with them, that, let's go forward. But, but not drag it out for a year. I mean, oh, I we know. are in we are in a meeting with living sites. Within the community, we have a new company. Well, I can work with Ted a little bit on that. 
I do have a, a couple things I wanted to clarify uh, with the coach. Just some, something to talk about maybe in the future. I'm having some issues with. Um, I've had people that are coming and asking me questions about, you know, obviously if somebody wants to make an apartment in their house, then that is a conditional use with an accessory dwelling, you know, whether it's in the house or if it's in the garage, as I understand the code. But like there isn't anything for somebody who wants to just rent out a room, and now I'm starting to get questions about Airbnb, and none of that falls under our zoning code. I don't know if we even want to touch it. I don't know. Really, I just don't know. Well, you're right, there's nothing in the code. And I don't know. My advice one person, well, if you're just, you know, if it's just a room that you're rent, that running out, I mean, that's really not, you know, yeah, that's what we look all of that. Yeah. I mean, yeah, the Airbnb, yeah. And what other communities are doing? I don't know. Sir. So Airbnb doesn't fall under the EMB regulations? No. 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 Could it? No. Only if it would have like five rooms, right? Oh, okay. Yeah. You're talking about an Airbnb is somebody who may own a house and they literally rent their house yes. on a for a week or a month or a yeah. Yeah. And there are, you know, this is this is new to the industry and so you know, zoning Administrators are just now starting to try to figure out how to legislate. Absolutely, because you know we do have a provision about short-term rentals, but I mean, how are you going to know? And how do we? I just yeah. And it just, it seems silly to regulate it because it's like it's an affordability issue, right? Like the I, I can see where the neighbors might want to yeah regulate. Yeah. 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 Well, you know, what it is, it, it's, it's a short-term lease. Yeah. Anybody who owns property can lease their property for its intended use. A single family can be leased as a single family for a year, six months, a month, a month. Well, now it's down to a week, a weekend. So it's really a term thing. How do you, how do you legislate that and how do you enforce that is beyond me. I yeah, because the owner's not there making a breakfast. You know, the owner's yeah. wrong. Right. Yeah. Well, this is like right. using a facility for their intent for its intended purpose. And they don't have like a maximum of number of people that can stay in the. Well, that's a separate thing. There, yeah. Once you become a multi-family residence, you have a whole lot of things that are driven by the Ohio Building Code that keep separation and things like that that are important. Um, our zoning code talks about basically like their tenement houses can't open your house up and just let rooms go for a night or things like that without notifying them and getting legal. And that's where the neighbors come in. So, you know, I think It's just questions that are starting to mm -hmm. come in. Oh yeah, they're gonna. So what are you telling them about the Airbnb? Um, but we don't have anything in our zoning regulations that, you know, that,